Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome, welcome. So this is TC here, speaking from the UK, London, or as we like to call it, the Big Smoke. I am IT Lab's Chief Talking Officer for the CTO Confessions podcast and the webinar series. Today we are here to do one of those webinars. Joining us from somewhere in the world is Ilya, co-founder of IT Labs. He'll be presenting a talk on multi-tenant approach. He'll be doing a presentation, a demo, and then a Q&A session afterwards. So let's not delay any further. Let's start the presentation. Ilya, the floor is yours, my friend. Hello. The topic we will be discussing today is about multi-tenancy, a database per tenant approach. At the beginning, let me introduce myself. My name is Ilya Mishov, and I am a co-owner and responsible for the technology track at IT Labs. I've been dealing with all different kinds of technology for the past 20 years. So what are we going to cover today? We will define what is a tenancy and list of some tenancy types, take a look at some use cases and scenarios, discuss the architecture. After that, I will demo two approaches with SQL and NoSQL database. Then we'll discuss the characteristics and in the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So what actually is tenancy? Tenancy is an ability of the application to host one or multiple clients, in this case tenants, and each of those tenants to have their own end users. Based on this, we can find different approaches on this matter. First, there are single tenant applications. Then there are multi-tenant applications with share database or share storage. And then there are multi-tenant applications with database per tenant, where their storage is actually separated for each of those tenants. Let's take a brief look at each of these tenant application types. The single tenant approach, as the name describes it, hosts only one tenant. If we need to use this type of application for multiple tenants, we would have to copy it on multiple environments, one environment per tenant. So the characteristics of this approach are, it is built only for a one tenant, it uses a separate application and a separate database. Apart from the single tenant approach, if we need to host multiple tenants on a single environment, we can use the multi-tenant with shared database approach. This approach enables all tenants to use a single application as well as to share a single database. As we are going to see later in this presentation, it has its own pros and cons. The characteristics of this approach are, it is built for multiple tenants, it uses single application, as well as it uses a single database. And the main topic of this presentation is multi-tenant with database per tenant approach. As we are going to see, this approach uses a single application for all of its tenants, but separate databases. Please note that this approach is not exclusive to the databases only, but it can be used for other application elements like file storage, communication with third-party services, etc. It promotes data separation while maintaining a single code base. The characteristics of this approach are, it is built for multiple tenants, it has a single application, and it uses a separate database per tenant. So, when do we need to isolate the data per tenant but keep the same business logic? Let's take a look at some use cases and scenarios. The first use case would be the SaaS solutions. There are several scenarios where we would need to allow multiple of our clients to use our product, but still those to be unaware of one from another. The typical examples of SaaS solutions are some very well-known products like Gmail, Office 365, Salesforce, even the cloud platforms like AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud Platform. But this approach is not exclusive only for the big players, a ton of other products are using it too. The second use case would be when we need to implement some compliance requirements in our solution, like HIP or GDPR. These standards, besides other things, they specifically require the data of each of the tenants to be isolated and sometimes even on isolated hardware. 
The approach we are discussing supports this scenario too. The third use case is when we require a non-biased database performance. Let's say that we have implemented a multi-tenant with shared database approach. Everything is stuck into a single database. So, the sales goes extremely well and every week we are onboarding a new client or tenant on the platform. Very soon we will find ourselves in a position where only a few of our clients are using 90% of the traffic and the database capacity, while most of the clients are using only the other 10%. Now, regarding the traffic and the application usage, it can be handled easily, especially with the auto-scaling ability of the cloud platforms. But those clients that are using the 10% of the capacity of the database, they will suffer the performance issues because of the other few. And depending on the software architecture of the solution, the refactor might not be as easy to be implemented, especially it can not even be implemented at all. A usual scenario in cases like this is to separate the more demanding clients in their own environment, thus applying the single tenant approach. Okay, now that we have covered some use cases, let's move and take a look at the architecture. The presented architecture here, for the sake of simplicity, is a straightforward one. We have an N-tier application and a database layer. However, there are a couple of things to be noticed. The API requests that the application will accept are limited by the domain but independent by the subdomain. And the tenant handler is set to be close to the repository layer. Having this approach, we want to retrieve the tenant-specific parameters like the connection string as late as possible. However, this doesn't have to be the case for every solution. The tenant resolution can happen as early as in the middleware once the request is accepted. There are pros and cons to each approach. If we resolve the client as early as possible, we can reject the request with an invalid domain before the business logic is executed. On the other hand, in a production environment, the invalid domain request can be filtered out at higher levels, like on a DNS or, or load balancing routing level. Resolving the tenant as late as possible gives us a deeper protection level, and sometimes the specific data would not even need to be resolved, for example, for some requests that don't need anything from the database. The next thing I would like to point out is the storing of the tenant-specific data. One of the solutions would be to store the data in a so-called master database where we would have a single record for each tenant having its connection string, file storage location, and some other data. This can be executed in a pretty secure way too. However, our preferred way of storing the tenant-specific data is using a secure storage service like AWS Secrets Manager. With this, we are using a solution specifically architected for data securing. Let's move on to the demos. We will see two very similar demo applications. The biggest difference is that one is using an MS SQL database and the other one a MongoDB database. With both approaches, we would like to emphasize the differences that will occur when delivering a solution. You can find the source code from both demo applications on IT Labs GitHub account on the links presented here. So, I will start by presenting the solution using Microsoft SQL Server database. Before we begin, there are a few things that we need to note. First is that I will be using mydomain.log, log stands for local, to access the application. And in order to do this, we need to do some modifications in the host file. We need to map 127.0.0.1 to whatever subdomain we are going to choose, for example, tenant101.mydomain.log. This will tell our machine that whatever requests are requested to 101mydomain.log to route them back to our local host. The next thing that is also important noting is that we will be using AWS region USS2 and how to securely access your AWS resources, we have a link on our GitHub account where the project is created, and you can find the link over here. Okay, so let's take a brief look at the code now. 
First, let's visit the startup CS file. The most important element in the startup CS file is the configuration services method. And uh, over here, we have uh, several mappings that I would like to present. The first mapping is the strategy that we are using. And we decided to use the HTTP request host strategy, which means that we will resolve the identity based on the HTTP host. However, you can resolve the identity by some other different strategies like HTTP header or maybe using JWT token claim. Next, we have implemented AWS Secrets Manager tenant storage. And using this method, we are actually uh, retrieving the secrets from the AWS Secrets Manager tenant storage based on the uh, identity that we have. And then, of course, we put the secrets into a cache because we don't want to go all the time to the secrets manager and with each and every request to retrieve the identities. We would like to cache those uh, for a certain period of time. Let's visit the request host tenant identification strategy. What we can see here is that we are looking for the request and if the request is not found of course we will throw an exception but if the request is found we are getting the first parameter of that request which should be actually our subdomain and retrieve the subdomain back and this value the subdomain will actually be used to retrieve the secret from aws secret manager Next, um, let's take a look at the implementation of AWS Secret Manager tenant storage. What we can see over here is that we are actually searching for the correct tenant based on the key identifier. And once we have that key identifier, we are retrieving the parameters from the storage, like connection string, which will be the most important for us. When we have the connection string, then we can use it to access our SQL Server database. In order to run our application, we created a one controller, tasks controller, where we get the request from the task. We actually have only two requests. One is get when it will list all the tasks in the database and we have one post request where we will insert a task into the database so if we try to run our application now let me go to start the application dot net run the api controller is this location and we are starting the application. It will start. However, we don't have any database, nor we do have set any secret. So there is nothing much that we can do at this point. If we try to execute some request, for example, tenant one SQL my domain dot log slash tasks. Um, it's HTTP GET, we try to send the request, we will get the response that there is no domain that we can access. This domain, as you recall, we set it into the host file. If I set this tenant one slash SQL in the host and save it, and try to run the request again, then on one SQL, send the request. We will get a different error that we do not have any connection string defined. And this is not just the connection string, but we also don't have any database set into the, our database storage. 
Now, the important thing to note in this approach is that we can add new tenants on the fly while the application is actually running. So we don't have to stop or start the application and disturb all the other tenants that are already using our app. Let's see how we can do this. First, let's create our AWS secret. Store a new secret. What we need here is connection string. Let me put my database connection string. SQL tenant one to copy this next secret name sql tenant none no tags we don't need automatic rotation and let's store secret so we have sql tenant one secret name uh, I changed the SQL tenant one instead of tenant one SQL, so I need to change this in my hosts file because otherwise the application will not run. SQL tenant one, save. Let's try to send the request now and see what's going to happen. So I just changed this to SQL tenant one go to task send the request and uh, we get the error that we cannot open the database sql tenant one this is because the database still does not exist in order to create the database we have created a controller, tenants controller, which actually runs the uh, migration schemas that we have created for the SQL database. So all we need to do is to run the tenants controller and it should create the database. If we go to our postman again, and instead of tasks, we run tenants tenants and it should be post send it takes a little bit longer because the database scripts are running wait for a while And we have the notification that the database has been successfully created. If we go now to the database and try to refresh, we can see that the SQL tenant one database has been created. Again, please note that we have not stopped our application yet. The application is still running. These are the errors that uh, we created using the invalid requests. So again, this is our database. We can take a look at the database. Our migration scripts, they created one tasks table. Let's try to run the tasks requests again. It should be get method, tasks, send and as expected we have no results because the task table is empty just to make this more valid we created in tasks controller another method post method that will add a task so we go to our tasks we have a method post and we need 
to add this form data values like name this is task name add description task description and is done as a parameter we'll set it to true send the request and we have the request back if we now again list all the tasks just change to get method send we can see that we have this task already created and if we go to the database we select all the rows from the database we can see that the task is done now i'm going to stop the application and do this all over but with debugging okay let's run the same application but with mongo database now let me navigate to the mongo application so it is cd tenant mongodb code so we have the code up and running um, so it's practically the same the startup is more or less the same just that it uses mongo database as a repository instead of sql server and we have one more parameter when we have the secret manager and that is the database because we need to set separately the database into the mongo uh, connection uh, uh, other than just the connection string the difference that we will note here when we are running the application using the mongo database is that we should not create the database specifically into our database server but it will be created with the initial first request actually with the initial first uh, time when we insert something into the database so currently if we take a look at our database we can see that there is no database collection over here uh, and this will be uh, created with our first insert so let's start and run the application um, The application is running and we need to do every step all over again so first let's create our aws secret go to aws create new secret we'll call this mongo tenant tenant 2 actually sorry this will be our connection string parameter and the connection string parameter will be this one and we're going to add another raw data base the database will be mongo tenant 3 let's say let me copy this i would like this to be also the name of my secret this is the name of my secret go next no automatic rotation store the secret so i have mongo tenant 3 as my secret next i need to update my hosts file 
go over here. That's my main log. Save it. And let's see what will happen when we make this request. Get HTTPS slash tasks send no connection strings defined. This is strange. Let's see what might be the issue. If I go here, Mongo tenant three. Three secret value. I have misspelled this connection string. Connection string. Save. Let's try again. Send. And yes, I have an empty record, even though there is no database created here. I refresh, no database. So, in order for a database to be created, all I have to do is just to create a new record. So we go here, we go to a post method, again tasks, click send, and we have a value. If we go to MongoDB database, Try to refresh the server, and there we go. We have the database, we have a collection, we have tasks collection. Double click on it, we can see that we have one object and one document, and in the same document we have ID, name, description, and so on. So this is one of the major differences between the SQL database and MongoDB database where in the SQL database, we had to create the database by running the migration, schema migration, while in Mongo database, we don't need to do anything because that's how the actual MongoDB works. If we want to take a look at the value during the API request, we just move to get method and click send, and there we have the object. In the end, let's take a look at some characteristics of the multi-tenancy with a database per tenant approach. Data separation. As previously mentioned, data separation could have a major impact moving towards this solution. There are a couple of items that needs to be considered regarding data separation. For good cross-tenant data separation, data is separated in the specific tenant's database and there is no mixing of data for different tenants. In the case of added complexity, where reports needs to summarize data from all tenants, usually some additional reporting approach is implemented on top of the implementation. Database performance and reliability. The database per tenant approach ensures better database performance. With this approach, data partitioning is implemented from the highest level, the tenants. Also, since data is separated per tenant, one indexing level is avoided the tenant distinction level. With a multi-tenant database approach, all collections, tables, are tenant-specific and we don't have index, indexing by tenant as we would have in a single database per tenant approach. Also, because the tenant's instances are separated, if some issue arises with one tenant's database, the application will continue working for all the other tenants. Implementation complexity. The application is tenant unaware. Tenant specific functionality is isolated in the tenant handler layer, and this information is used in the data access data repository layer of the application. This ensures that there will be no tenant specific functionality across the different application domain layers. Database scalability. For small databases, all tenants can share one database server resource. As database size and usage increase, the hardware of the database server resource can be scaled up. 
or a specific tenant's database can be separated onto a new instance. SQL versus NoSQL database. For NoSQL database engines, the process of creating a database and maintaining the database schema is generally easier and more automated. With the correct database user permissions, as data comes into the system, the application code can create both the database and the collections, meaning that when defining a new tenant in the system, the only thing that must be done is to define the tenant's information in the secret storage. Then the application will know how to use the tenant-specific data. However, if we introduce custom indexes and functions on the database level, then the solution will have to integrate those in the delivery process. For SQL database engines, the process of defining a new tenant in the system will involve creating a database for that tenant. This includes having database schema scripts for generating the tenant's database, creating the new database for the tenant, and executing the schema scripts on the new database. This will have to be included in the delivery process for each new tenant. Deployment and maintenance. The deployment procedure should cover all tenant databases. To avoid any future complications, all databases must always be on the same schema version. When a new application version is released, database changes will affect all tenant instances. In the process of defining maintenance functions and procedures, all tenant instances should be covered. It should be noted that having differences in the tenant database schemas will result in extra effort to maintain all the databases. Backup and restore. A backup process should be defined for all tenant databases. By having well-defined procedures for backup and restoration, these procedures can be performed on one tenant's instance at a time without affecting all the other tenants. Thank you for that, Ilya. And uh, I have to apologize. We didn't realize that the quality of the video was uh, actually not rendering very well uh, with our attendees. So huge apologies from that. It's just typical. We tested this all uh, several times previously and we go live and <laughs> you know how it is. So um, yeah, so apologies. that We'll be sending out the video and hopefully you'll be able to fill in the blurs with the, uh, the required information and, um, you know, and uh, yeah, still get value out of what was presented here. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to go to a Q&A session uh, with Ilya. Ilya, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear, friend. So, um, so hopefully we've got some questions coming in. Has anybody got any questions out there in the, uh, in the audience, please? I know I have. Tell you what, turn the video on so you can see who's talking. Any questions? Oh, there we go. So question from Darko. In the multi-tenant one data base, uh, base approach, for .NET Frameworks MVC application, what are the best practices and approaches to create and override controllers when we want to have different implementation of the same method for each tenant? Different implementation of the same method for each tenant. Um, I guess what Darko wants to ask is uh, if there is a different logic but we still name the method the same, but there is a different logic for each tenant. Uh, in that case, <clears throat> uh, what I will say is that probably you should isolate the implementation uh, in a kind of a service oriented segment. Uh, if we have multiple if thens and such things based on the tenants, then we will just make the application more and more complex which uh, is a not good approach at all because you will definitely have to take care of all the tenants within the same solution uh, and the complexity will just rise and at the end you will find the lots of uh, spaghetti over there that you wouldn't you would not be able to to handle that out so in situations like this uh, 
my suggestion will be uh, to take a look if you can um, separate the implementation from the core of the of the code as a separate service and just ask this service whenever the implementation comes. This is one of the approaches that I will handle this. Excellent. Okay, thank you for that. There were some more questions here. I'm just looking to see if um, a dark had a kind of follow-on question. Is it possible to have one default controller and override it with new controllers uh, only with methods that we want to change for each tenant? It is possible, it is possible. Uh, however, I will say again, yes, uh, eventually you will end up with having a solution with, uh, with different implementations for each, uh, for each of your tenants. Uh, one tenant has uh, one, um, one specifics in one method, the other tenant will have some other specifics in another tenant, and you will end up by um, either having some type of, uh, of switches, if this is the tenant uh, use this implementation, if this is the tenant use this method, which is eventually you will get to a very cluttered code. My approach will be to have a different callouts to separate services that eventually you will be building for this for the specific tenant. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. I think that answers that. Hopefully that answers your question, Darko. Um, so I have a question lined up. Um, what's the database? I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I do. I do know what a database is. I just thought I'd kind of throw in that joke there. So, um, can uh, can I implement uh, multi-tenancy when I have an uh, have an identity provider in place? Generally, yes, and even more, it should be even easier than uh, this specific solution because the identity provider actually provides you with different uh, actually provides you with separation of the tenants. Um, it also depends how it will be implemented. Uh, now, over here, it is interesting that usually when you have an identity provider, you will use something like JWT token or uh, some other way of uh, distinction between the, between the tenants. So in this case, uh, you, uh, the one, the engineer or the architect that is implementing this actually uh, does not need to implement based on the URL or the subdomain, but he can have some other uh, solutions to implement the distinction, the distinctions from one tenant to another. In that manner, in that case, I will probably use the distinctions from the JWT token. Okay, excellent. Just looking to see if we've got any more questions. I have another one lined up. Okay, uh, nothing at the moment. So my next question is, is how can multi-tenancy be implemented in a serverless environment? Like for, for example, AWS or Azure? AWS Lambda or Azure functions, serverless environment with, with multi-tenancy. Um, this is kind of tricky approach. Uh, I must admit that uh, I am not uh, very fond of serverless. Uh, I mean, actually, I, I like serverless, but for the specifics that they do, for certain tasks mm. to be executed and to be done. However, uh, if we need to implement the whole application or the whole service based on only serverless functions, that's something that uh, I'm not very fond of, not at this moment, not right now. Right. Uh, in, in case of, of uh, having a serverless application and implementing the multi-tenancy, uh, I think that uh, you will have to have probably one method, uh, one, one function with, when the distinctions will be done and all of the functions where, where the distinctions between the, the tenants will be done like over here that we are using the subdomain distinction and all of the functions will have to execute this, this function either previous or after they execute their, their probably previous uh, uh, before executing. Um, when the request comes, the first will, will we need to be done the distinction and then in the cookie that will ask the next, next function in the request that will ask the next following question, these distinctions should be followed, uh, should be carried on. Right. So when each executing function needs to uh, save anything to the database, they already need to know the, 
the specifics of the of the tenant. Sure. Okay. I don't know if I was very clear on this, but uh, yeah, I, I think uh, that was a pretty good answer. I, I've got some follow-on questions, but in uh, in service of the um, uh, the time that we have, um, I just wanted to. I mean, in terms of databases, I haven't done a great deal of database work myself. Um, but one of the areas that I'm interested in is the huge amounts of data that we have uh, kicking around now. I mean, in terms of efficiencies, what, how can you kind of um, make these systems and, and, and setups more efficient and predictable? Well, that's uh, one of the good parts of the multi-tenancy that I uh, also mentioned in the presentation. And sure. it, it, it usually happens. It usually happens that uh, you have a couple of huge clients that have a huge amount of data they want to store in the database. And uh, besides that, you have uh, um, uh, you have these other clients that are in general uh, much, much more than these uh, huge clients that, that, sells, that use the database much more modestly. In, they have lower requests, they have uh, uh, not that much data. And uh, what, happens in this, in, uh, what happens is that uh, when, um, uh, when uh, when you try to execute some search, which more or less is the same uh, for um, which more or less is the same uh, for each of the tenants in the database, uh, the search goes over all the records. Of course, it depends on the indexes you have put over there. It goes all, all over all the records, and right. it is as slow. For example, for the smaller clients that have fewer records, the search is generally sm uh, slow just because of these huge clients that have tons of records because yes. if they are situated in one day in one table in one database they need to query all of the records right so this is one of the important thing why multi tenancy is okay so everybody gets its share and yes. even more uh, you can have much uh, performance uh, database server for the uh, for the uh, clients that have uh, big databases and low, low with uh, lower performance database are with the clients that have uh, lower databases. Excellent, good. Um, as, as you were just uh, answering that, and um, thank you for that, Amelia, uh, we've got a tsunami of questions come in. Um, I'm just, going, just looking through them now. Um, so we've got here, we go, we've got one here from uh, Gunjan uh, Gupta. Uh, our application is over 400 tables now. Oh. Do you still recommend that uh, the uh, you keep the da databases separate? I guess that was kind of answered by the previous question. Um, Do you want to repeat that again? No, no, no. I understand. I understand. Uh, the uh, the database is huge, and what are we doing with multi tenancy in this manner? Um, it, well, the database is huge in terms of. Uh, tables, but it also depends uh, about the the amount of data. Mm. Um, again, you should ask yourself uh, how do the smaller players in your database, smaller tenants in your database, feel when they do try to insert, update, or search for something, or query for some records. Uh, even 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 if it is a 400 tables, I don't think that it actually matters much uh, whether it is 10 tables or 400 tables if you handle everything using the scripts and using the some of the continuous delivery and continuous sure. integration tools. In yeah. that manner, it, it shouldn't matter. Okay. And th there was a follow-on question to that, which is also, can you tell us how to ensure tools uh, how to ensure tools uh, that all changes are done simultaneously in the database during major upgrades? Well, yes, uh, yes, uh, there are several tools that, that you can use. Uh, for example, entity, I don't know which type of database you're actually using, but uh, entity framework and uh, it, it has scripts, so you can use this tool. Uh, with my, with entity migrations that everything is migrated to each and every database. So that's right. that's one of the tools that, that you can use. Uh, if it is a NoSQL database, then um, uh, 
mainly you don't need any tools because the database is uh, actually created as the inserts and updates in the day in the database console. Mm. Uh, the database is generally created by itself. Um, but of course, when uh, when you have uh, no SQL database and you would want to let's say index to, to create more complex indexes in the database uh, for some searches, then again you should have your scripts and have them as part of your delivery process. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Gojan did actually reply. It was uh, Microsoft SQL. Um, so hopefully. Hopefully that answers your question, uh, Gunjan. Uh, just moving on to the next question. We've got a few more minutes left. Um, so Boris, Boris Donev, uh, apologies if I've pronounced your names wrong. Um, how do you onboard a new tenant? Do you have tools for automation uh, where the secrets, domains, and so on are automatically added? S uh, since you're using AWS specifically for that, or do you do it manually? Yes. So what I presented over here, I specifically did it manually just to take a look at how actually it is done. But uh, it's very easy uh, to be implemented as a part of your delivery process or however you want to do when, when a new client comes in, uh, you, can, you can automatically script it with either AWS CLI, so you use those uh, methods and functions to create new AWS secret and simply create a new database if it is a relational database. If it is a NoSQL database, then you don't, don't need to do anything. And it's uh, just remember, it's not just the secret, but it's also that you need to uh, set up a domain, set up um, actually a subdomain pointing to your certain location. Now, it also depends where do you host domains. If you host the domains on, 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 on AWS, then you can use the CLI also to create a domain. But if you close the domains on some other place where you need to menu with, when there is no um, uh, 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 possibility to script that, but you need to manually manage the domains, then you still have to do it manually. However, uh, building a script is it's not a big deal in this manner. I deliberately uh, display this manually so everybody is aware actually what uh, the uh, what the multi tenancy is doing and what are the the required steps to to take in in order to do this sure okay and i think we've got um thank you for that Ilya. uh hopefully that's answered your question boris um so the final question uh, question i'm going to pick up is from manaj Kano, um and the question is as follows it's said that multi tenant cloud platform has plenty of disadvantages um, as it's inflexible, not secure enough, not having uh, too much horsepower, and the elephant, <laughs> and an elephant of an animal to maintain. How do you factor? Um, how do you factor uh, for non-web centric apps? Uh, non-web centric apps uh first uh, yes uh, the multi-tenant is much bigger and yes the maintenance of such a such a solution is definitely much harder than maintenance of a single tenant solution and i can't argue with that mm. uh that's true but there are some benefits that multi-tenancy provides and uh, we need to take uh, those into consideration again um, uh, too much horsepower. Well, yes, that's uh, more or less the same. Uh, if, uh, but the point is that actually that on the same database server, you can host mo multiple, uh, you can host multiple tenants. You don't need to host each of those tenants into the separate, uh, uh, into a separate database. So generally the database will be more or less the same, uh, the same data, uh, if you use the same database server for, uh, for all the tenants. Um, how do I factor it for non-web centric apps? I don't know at this moment, but, uh, you would need to find any distinctions uh, for all the uh, non-web centric apps. Like, uh, how do you how how do you um, 
how do you separate one tenant from another? How, how do you know uh, which tenant actually is, up, is accessing your application if it is a non-web tenant? You have to have this, this distinction and, and play on that distinction. I can't answer precisely at this moment. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Ilya. Um, so we've kind of run out of time. So uh, much gratitude uh, to your presentation and, um, and answering those questions. Um, uh, how, how did it feel being in the hot seat? <laughs> uh, it, it's okay. Uh, I mean, uh, I've been in the hot seat for several times. It's not my first oh, okay. time, so yeah. that's good. <laughs> I'm managing my way, yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's beautiful. <laughs> So, uh, so thank you, and um, thank you to the audience uh, for for joining us. Um, I hope you got great value out of this. Uh, I know I haven't done a lot of work with databases myself, um, but I've definitely learned something here, which is uh, which is always good. So, let us know your thoughts about uh, this webinar, and um, I'm sure we're going to get some comments around the resolution. We will fix that. Uh, we will definitely fix that. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, and uh, just as a quick reminder, there'll be a new newsletter coming out from IT Labs uh, today. And we have a podcast with another co-founder of IT Labs, uh, Barney, uh, our, our CEO. And we're going to be talking about the principles for the foundation of technology-driven organizations. There you go. There's a title for you uh, with a subtitle of Herding the Kittens in Technology. So hopefully that's got your curiosity up and uh, I look forward to uh, doing that podcast with Barney. And we also have a, a webinar lined up for the 7th of May with uh, Blagway, uh, our CTO of IT Labs uh, on blockchain, unif how can blockchain unify the chains in a supply chain? Sounds intriguing. So watch out for those. Uh, look in your in inboxes for the emails and the reminders and we look forward to seeing you next time. Keep safe, keep well, and look after each other. That's All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.